Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. How are you going? Now, here is how it looks today. We have a new sound system. We have uh, kids doing a lot of stuff around with uh, loud material. We have our pathfinders creating a tent in the background of me. Nothing can go wrong today. Am I supposed to preach a sermon? You know, I actually didn't have time to prepare sermons. So I'm trying to distract you so nobody will listen to me what I'm saying. But all of this is happening with a reason. Now, first thing first, do you all have one of these? If you don't have one of these, put your hand up and my able fast assistant Denise will come and give you one. You need to, there is one couple of days over there. Uh, uh, perhaps Aiden can help us out. Aiden, there are some hands. So just keep your hands up if you don't have one of them. So if you want to stood the knees in all these cows with the kids, create yourself with this. Make image of yourself with this pipe cleaner as I am preaching the sermon. If you can be on the church side when I preached about temple, it's going to be the same sermon. It's time to get up now and leave if you don't want to listen twice to the same sermon. Otherwise, stay here because I'll never play some music beautifully afterwards. And this is just worth staying here for as well. Okay. Temple. You know, this is a, there is a Bible text that Joel so beautifully read before. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And it goes to say a few more things than just this. It goes to say that you should look after this temple. Let me read again this text. I want you to go into this text and saturate yourself with the meaning of this Bible text. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? What does it come next? You are not, can't hear you. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. You were what? Bought at a price. Remember these elements. You are the temple of who? Holy Spirit, you are not what? Your own, but you were bought with what? A price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. So kids, just to remind you again, there is a tabernacle there, there is a Springwood Church, there is a heaven, there is creation, there is a Solomon's Temple. When you create something from this era, come and place it here. We would love to see your creations. We love you working with us in this sermon. Now, when I was young, and some of you will remember this time when, when we read this text and said, look, what this text means is this, that you actually can't put tattoos on yourself. This is what it means. You know, you can't just do anything with your body. You have to uh, kind of think of your body as something different, something strange, and you are kind of not your own. This was the main message. You are not your own. You belong to God. God is your master. And do you know what I felt when I was a young boy? I am no one. This text is telling me I'm nobody. I'm just renting out this body. And really, God is everything. I am just absolutely zero. What was problem with this theology a little bit is this, that it was building on the greatness of God and diminishing the value of me as a person. I always felt like God is this superhuman, supernatural being, spirit and everything, but me, I don't really count for much. That's why I should just give him my body, serve him faithfully and blindly, and because this is all I'm good for, just serving. I don't think this is a good theology of the temple in this Bible text. I don't think this is what the Bible says at all about us as temples. I think the temple is so much more than what you think it is. I think that temple is so much more than what you think it is. I would love you to show you a little bit about what Jesus thought about this, what the Bible thinks when they say about the temple. Back in Jesus' time, in Paul's time, New Testament time, when they look at the temple, there were certain associations in their mind. 
Uh, Jefferson Betke writes this about this understanding. In the first century in Judea, the world temple held plenty of weight and was incredibly charged. In Paul's and Jesus' world, it specifically was the place where heaven and earth met. Where heaven and earth met. As if heaven and earth were two separate circles. And then in the middle, when you move those circles in the middle, you have this area that overlaps. And that area is a temple. That's the place where God and earth, where heaven and earth meet. This is the place of temple. This is the understanding of Paul and uh, Jesus and the, and the whole Bible. Now, I want to take you for a very brief short story to explain why we are building a tent over here, so ably by our pathfinders, and to help you understand how did Jesus and how did Bible people try to perceive what, tem what actually the temple is. I'm gonna take you to the beginning of the world of creation. In the beginning of very Bible, in book of Genesis, there is this beautiful description of how God created the world. He creates something so wonderful and makes then something even better by populating it. And when we read it in the Bible, we thought, oh, this is great, this description of creation. But when the Jewish people read this Bible text, and when the ancient Middle East people read this Bible text, they saw it a bit differently. Do you know what they saw in the creation account? They saw a temple building template. Temple building template. Now, back in the times of Middle East part, when there were lots of different temples, so there were lots of different gods, there were two things you need to do when you build a temple. One is, when the temple is built, you have to put image of the God to whom this temple is devoted. So they would put like a, something that looks like a God, what they think God looks like. They would put the image of that God into the temple. And the second thing they would do at the time is they would rest when the temple is finished. They would have celebration. They would say, temple is now finished. Let's and celebrate this. And then they would invite God's presence. God would come and they, he would be, they would invite God to flood this temple with his presence, with his power, with whatever he is to be there. Does this remind you of something? Does this temple building template remind you of something in the Bible? Well, similar stuff is happening in the very book of Genesis with the creation story. They have stolen the whole thing from the original story in the Genesis. In the Genesis, you find that when God creates, he puts then on the sixth day image bearers. He creates you and I in his image. And image bearers, differently from the other temple who are just stationary, made of stone, and made of rock, and made of stupid thing, really, these image bearers are flesh, and they are thinking, feeling persons who not just reflect their God, but who can relate to that God as well. And then God rests. God rests on the Sabbath and he says, stop now, let's make sure we remember where have you guys come from, let's celebrate. And then, as a final act of approval, he actually walks in the garden. He enters the garden and he talks to people, to image bearers. And when ancient Middle East people read the book of Genesis and creation uh, story, they understand that this is actually now the temple. This temple won't have walls, but this temple will be much, so much better. It's, here is how it's different. Back in the old other cultures of the polytheist cultures, they have many gods, and all of these gods accounted for specific areas. Why, this is why all the gods had to have a certain temple made of walls and bricks and columns, and you know how they looked in back in time. But when God creates his temple, the earth, he's proclaiming one thing. 
the whole earth is mine. Back the polytheist gods, they were just uh, regional, particular gods of certain things like sun or fertility or uh, stuff like this. God is saying when he creates his temple, I am God of everything. I am not limited by anything. But it's a beautiful thing to see that God in the end enters the garden. He enters and he is there with them. God dwells. This God who is spirit, who is bigger outside of our reality, this God speaks. This God is not just force, but intelligent being. And this God is creator of the physical world. He's connected to our physical world. So he's a part of us. He's not somewhere away, too, too far away. God continues, and the Bible continues talking constantly about this temple. When this was not good, when we sinned and we were kicked out of the Eden, which was the temple in itself, beautiful place where God dwells, God is appearing and wanting to dwell with us. He wants to be present with us all the time. So in the wilderness, he is... Uh, building a tabernacle so that his glory again dwells within the people. Bible says, build me a tabernacle so I may dwell with you. We understand as the Adventist church that this tabernacle, this heavenly sanctuary is representing his plan of salvation in so many beautiful ways. And I don't have time to talk about this, but it's a beautiful, beautiful doctrine as well. But he is there dwelling amongst the people. He's holy. Nobody can touch it. But he lives there. This is the place where heaven meets the earth. This is where Israelites, the earthlings, are able to be in the presence of God. So tabernacle is a beautiful place to be there. Even later on, in the, when we are gone from the world, which is going to be recreated, and we are in the new earth, Again, you find this beautiful text when God describes what heaven is. And he says, now the what? Dwelling. Now the dwelling of presence of God is with men, with people. And he will live with them. Earlier, before this text, God says, now the tabernacle of God is with us. Other translations say, a tabernacle simply means dwelling. I am with you. I'm close to you. And so... All throughout the Bible, you find this text where God is close to us. Not just in the tabernacle, which was obviously God's presence there because you had this pillar of the smoke rising during the day and pillar of fire during the night. But later on in the Solomon's temple as well, you find that when Solomon built his temple, that glory, Shekinah glory came down and filled the place full of of, of God, so much so that priests were disrupted. Priests couldn't work there anymore because there was so much of God's shakana glory. I can't even imagine what this is. And then something sad happens. Even though God shows up and everybody can see that, He's there. <coughs> People rebel and they start worshiping other gods which are no gods. And they abandon God, who is only God, and God lets them suffer. God lets the enemy come, Babylonians, and conquer them, conquer them. And they are led away into captivity. And in the captivity, there they are remembering what's happened, how they, there was a place where God dwelt among them. And now they are not here anymore. They are without land, they are without rulers, they are powerless, they are just scattered all around the, ground, around the earth. They come back after 40 years in the captivity, in Babylonian first and then Middle Persian captivity. They come back and they build another temple, but this temple is never filled with Shekinah glory again. So they have this big temple. It's called later on Herod's temple because he fixed it up. Zerubbabel, I think, built it in the first place. There's a temple. It's rebuilt. It's not in ruins anymore. But Shekinah glory never comes again. And for 400 years, people are wondering, 
will God again be present with us? They've seen him there in the Garden of Eden. They've seen God's presence in the tabernacle in the wilderness. They've seen God's, in, God's presence in Solomon's temple. But now that they have sinned and been enslaved and returned back to their land, there is no glory of God. It's just religion. But there is no presence of God. And when you have only religion, but no presence of God, Everybody recognizes something is wrong with this model. Something is wrong with these people. Something is wrong with this religion. This is not about any more real connection, but it's just about service and servitude. For 400 years, people are asking themselves, between book of Malachi and book of Matthew, what happens? Where is God? And then John the evangelist John starts writing a beautiful book called Gospel of John. And this is how he starts. In the beginning. Where does your mind go when you see this word, in the beginning? Where do your minds go? In the beginning, to the book of Genesis. When God originally built his temple. The whole earth, the Bible says, is God's and everything within it. And God will dwell and everything belongs to God and God's presence was visible. In the beginning there was Word. And Word was with God. And God was, and Word was God. Everybody agrees. In the beginning, when our earth was visited by God, how wonderful it was when we were present, when there was God and God was able to be close to us. How wonderful this is. And we are all thinking, wow, wouldn't be wonderful to be this again, but these people for 400 years have suffered and there is no God. And then John says something beautiful in verse 14. Do you know what he says? He says this, but this word became flesh. The word that God became one of us. The word became flesh and made his what? Dwelling among us. And this word dwell, dwelling is word eskonosen in Greek. And it actually means to fix a tent. To pitch a tent. This is what this word means to dwell among us. God has literally pitched the tent in our backyard. And he said, Kendall and Irving and Robin, I'll come to live with you. Hello, I'm your neighbor. And when readers of the book of John realize this, God is again dwelling with people. They realize this is something really special. This person who was made flesh is God himself. That's how God introduces Jesus. He is God who has pinched his tent, pitched his tent in our backyard because he wants to be close to us. Because he wants again that there be a place where earth meets the heaven so we can feel his presence. We can feel that he's close to us. And so John is purposefully announcing the new Genesis, a new beginning the beginning of new creation, the beginning of new reality that we can experience with God. God himself has come down to dwell with us, to be with his people. What would you do if you really believed that? What if you and I really believed that? That God himself has come to the earth to dwell with us. How different would our lives be? Because there is different thing that we think of what we believe and different way of how we practice what we think, how we practice our beliefs. And I believe that most of us have this kind of knowledge, yeah, 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 sure, of course, you just keep preaching, I'll be fine in five minutes, I'll go for lunch, this is, this is my duty for this weekend. But we forget to think that God can really be close to us. Would you stop, if you really believe that God is close to you, stop to talk to him? Would you live differently? 
would you ask him to transform your lives and take away this, this superficiality of attending church and reading, sometimes saying, yes, I'm, a, I'm Christian, and all this kind of stuff that we do, just this minimum, bare minimum of belonging to God's kingdom. Would you chuck it as a dross, as a rubbish, and say, no, 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 this is not enough. This is simply not enough. I have to stop. I have to allow God to come into my life because he's here. I have to do something different with my life. I have to allow him to work through me. I have to be transformed. I have to talk about this. I have to do something with this because God has come to live in my backyard. You know, just before he goes back to heaven, Jesus is promising something even better than his own presence. Something even better than his own presence. And he says this, it is for your good, Jesus says before he goes to heaven, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. When he comes, he will convict the world about this and this and that. He will convict you about judgment and about so many things. But he will come. He continues saying this, that when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. When he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. And then Bible goes on in Acts and says, receive the Holy Spirit. And then just before he goes to heaven, he says this to his disciples. Go to Jerusalem. I will let the camera in a second, guys. Bryce. Go to Jerusalem. And don't move from there until the Holy Spirit has come to you. When Holy Spirit comes onto you, then you can go and be my witnesses. But he is promising this thing. That when Jesus goes to heaven and the presence of God goes back to heaven, we will be not left without God's presence. But God's presence will be where after Jesus' ascension to heaven? In us. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. And you are not your own because you were bought with a price. This text doesn't mean you are value, valueless and God is everything. But God is saying that you people, I, we are temple of God. We are the temple of God and we are walking presence where earth and, and, and heaven meet together. Look at the screen and you will see what temple of God is right now. You and I, according to the Bible, are temple of God and we can do something absolutely beautiful. What would our lives be if you let the Holy Spirit dwell among you? What would your lives be if you truly are the temple? You are not alone if you are temple because God dwells in you all the time. You are not God. You are not a God. Don't think this about yourself. But God's presence dwells within you. You are not powerless. Whether you are small or very, very old, you are very, very strong. You can be the most potent power in your neighborhood for good because you are the temple and God dwells in you. You are not forgotten. You are very, very much in God's mind. Whether you are old or young, young, you are not forgotten. God has purpose for these temples of God. And He wants to do something absolutely wonderful and powerful in your communities. Wherever you come, there is holiness, there is joy, there is a peace, there is reconciliation because you people bring God's presence wherever you appear. You are not a sinner. Yes, you do sin, and you will probably continue to do so because we are flesh is weak, but the spirit is strong. You are a saint. You sin sometimes, but you are saint always because in you is who? Holy Spirit, and you are a temple of God. You are this temple of God of spirit. Wherever you go, wherever you go, there is a trouble. 
There is a trouble because Satan sees that you are going to put asunder his wonderful plan to deceive and lie and to destroy. But you will come and you will bring, bring truth and love and peace. And Satan will hate this. And he will try to come and destroy you. That's why you have trouble at work, relationships, anywhere else. But you can't stop because you are the temple of God. You are walking, breathing, living trouble for Satan's kingdom because we, the temple of God, are establishing God's kingdom. We are establishing God's kingdom. Do you believe that? If you believe that, you need to acknowledge this. Sometimes you and I are just sitting and thinking, well, yes, this is so. I invite you to say a special prayer. I want to pray that the Holy Spirit comes in your lives as well. But if you want to do this, just as an act of standing up for this, bring your image of yourself that you can made with your pipe cleaner and put it down in this area where the kids have made some of the furniture, more or less, of the temples. If you're brave enough, our musicians will play a song just for a few minutes. Bring your image and say, God, I want to be a temple. This is me. This represents me. I'm going to put it down. And I want you to come into my heart. And more than ever, I want you to take power of, over my mind, over my heart. I want to start anew. I will not be satisfied just to attend church sometimes. I will not be satisfied from my life just to go away as it is, as it, as it doesn't matter. I am temple of Holy Spirit. Bring your little image forward, put it down and say, this is me, God. I'm now in your hands.